Motion to take item 33 and 34 out of order. Seconded Hello? by Councilmember Balombek. Before we get to those items, everyone, please keep your computer or phone on mute until you're speaking. Thank you all very much. Item number 33, amend zoning map for 259, 267, 352 Mystic Street. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Councilmember Scanlon. Councilmember Scanlon, we're there. We're there should be read something in the record, or would you like to speak on this? There, there should be someone here to speak to this item. Okay, is Ray? Are you here to speak on this item? Scanlon, I don't hear anything from Ray. Are there others that are supposed to speak? Um, not on this item. There will be other. Is there anyone here to speak on item 33, public hearing to amend the zoning map for Mystic Street? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. Council Member Scanlon. Yeah, this um these parcels um someone is calling to make a correction to a change in their zoning um as a result of the green code. Um Mr. Radatovich is supposed to be calling in. I'm not sure if he actually made it through. Um so if you want, I guess we could move on to the next one. Motion to hold it in abeyance. <clears throat> Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Item number 34, amend zoning map for 3 Beacon, 180 Germania, 8 Bell. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Council Member Scanlon, you have the floor. Yeah, there again, this item, there should be um, someone here to speak on this, Mr. Tom Price. This is another situation where they're, they're applying to correct a change in the green code. And if he has not made it through, then I guess we can just hold it. Motion to hold it in abeyance. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Is is everybody in from the waiting room? I just got a text that there's <clears throat> people waiting in the waiting room. Is that a possible reason? There was a delay, but at this point, there are no more people in the waiting room. Everyone who has tried to get into the meeting is in. All right, thanks. Okay, so we'll hold this item in abeyance. They were taken out of order, so we'll return to them at a later point in the meeting, and we'll go. We'll start at the top of the agenda. Item number one: veto message CCP twenty dash three five five ordinance amendment chapter four seventy nine traffic ordinance. And Mr. Chairman, uh, we were asked to table this item. Motion is to table, seconded by Council Member Bowman. I'm sorry, that was the motion is to table, seconded by Council Member Golumbeck. Item number two, food store license 2577 Bailey. Items open. This item is open. It's in the university district. It is Council Member Wyatt? Motion to table. Motion, motion to table. table. Motion is to table, seconded by Council President Pridgen. Item number three, food store license 904 Broadway. Items open. Mr. Chair, this is in my district. I have yet to meet with the applicant. I know that they spoke to my office and were supposed to schedule a time for me to go out there. I mean, I have a lot of you know questions and apprehensions about another food store on Broadway. So we have a lot to discuss with the applicant, so I motion this to be tabled. Motion to table. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Item number four, food store license 257 Niagara, aka 259 Niagara. Um, motion. This is yes. uh, in my district. Is there anyone here to speak on this item? Anyone here to speak on 
257 Niagara Street. Okay, if no one is here, uh, can you just put this without uh, rec for right now? This is around the corner for me. I, I believe it's just a change in ownership, but I would like to also review their uh, current condition. So you can put this for without rec right now. Please. Motion to send without recommendation. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Item number five, food store license 706 Tonawanda. Items open. Mr. Chairman. Council Member Golombek. Yeah, thank you. Um, on this, uh, I'd like to send it without recommendation. I did want to talk to Karen uh, Gordon about this because uh, several of the other businesses and residents in the area have called with concerns. Um, there's a deli uh, like 100 feet away from this on the other side of the street. Um, there's a moose club directly across the street. There is a car dealership adjacent to this property. Um, and there's some concerns that with another store in the neighborhood that it's gonna create parking and uh, uh, other issues. Um, so I wanna send it without rec. I'll be in touch with Karen to touch base with her and then hopefully we'll have this resolved by next week. Thank you. Motion to send without rec. Seconded by council member Golombek. Item number six, opposition to the Montante solar proposal. Motion to the table, item six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 12. Motion is to table seconded by council member, council president Pridgen. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Council member Golombek. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention on the solar panel issue, uh, um, we met with Montante, we met with uh, the developer, we met with the sewer Hello? authority people. Yeah, yeah. We met with um, residents of the North Hello. District and Niagara District. And um, we believe that uh, while this project in and of itself is very commendable um, and supportive of solar energy, uh, the devil of course is always in the details. And after meeting with you know, these numerous groups, um, it looks as if this project is uh, no longer being pushed forward. Um, I don't wanna say that it's DOA at this point, um, but I think that there was a realization that our waterfront land could be better utilized as public space, as parkland. Um, and I wanna thank the many, many different people, uh, individuals uh, from the North District, as well as groups and organizations that got involved in this um, and keep are in the process of keeping Unity Island uh, a parkland, uh, an overwhelming parkland, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to see uh, you know more additions with trails and other uh, uh, amenities on the island. But uh, this could not have been done if it wasn't for the partnership. Uh, that we have with the all the other individuals in the North District and the organizations throughout the city of Buffalo. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of them. All right, thank you for those comments. Next item. Item 13, ATV and unregistered recreational use vehicles. Items open. This item is open. Um, I know several of my colleagues have uh, have brought this up and talked about it. Who would like to start? Chair, Chair. Council Member Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just wanted to start, um, give a little summary on this item and say that uh, this item really comes from a place of, it's been a long, long year, a long summer in uh, in my district with ATVs, dirt bikes, mini bikes, you know, riding not only on our side streets, but now it's on our main streets, Genesee. I have them burning through uh, Lovejoy Street. They're tearing up our parks and it really seems to get worse every year. It feels like what we have right now is not working. So um, just wanted to bring, you know, some members to this committees where we could talk about it and, you know, try to find a solution. I know it's not an easy problem to solve, but the residents are calling my office uh, looking for us to do something. I'd certainly like to do that, whether it be increased fees, fines, but also 
uh, wanted to look into impounding the vehicles. Uh, these ATVs are not legal, uh, not legal on our street, not legal in our parks. Um, so I'd like to work out the logistics of potentially um, impounding them, potentially keeping them for uh, you know, 30 days, 60 days, or, or whatever we have to do. But um, I want to send a clear message that, uh, you know, these, those driving these vehicles, um, you know, we don't want them on our streets. We don't want them in our parks anymore. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I know this year I've received a lot of phone calls from concerned residents because they're having, in some instances, dozens or even hundreds of um, off-road vehicles taking over the streets. And I know we have, um, I, I know we've had several council members who brought this up and I know council member Rivera wanted to touch base on this. So majority leader Rivera, go ahead. Thank you very much, chairman. I've worked with the Buffalo police department commissioner and the district chiefs, um, and some of the business people who are uh, suffering as a result of what's going on with these ATVs in our commercial districts in our parks. And I think that we have to make sure that the, that the vehicle and traffic laws are being enforced in, in Buffalo as they are throughout different parts of the state. And there has to be a penalty for these folks that are doing this. Uh, they're going in our parks, they're driving on the grass, um, they're up and down the side streets, zigzagging out of traffic down the wrong way of the street. At some point, somebody's gonna get seriously injured and the police department has a challenge, and I understand that um, there are times that they're, they're so large, there are maybe 50 to 100 of them, and they don't wanna get into a chase, and I understand that because that, put, that puts uh, the residents at risk, but we have to find a way to track these down and get them off the street. Uh, maybe it's through intelligence, maybe if we can't disperse them because they're so large, we should be able to identify them, where they're coming from, where they're going to, and that point perhaps, um, use whatever leverage we can to get those uh, vehicles off the street and make it so difficult for them to get the vehicles back once they're seized. Uh, we want to make sure that it is so difficult for those to get those vehicles back once they're in our impound and that the penalty is so stiff that it's not worth for them taking them out. So I want to continue to work on this with the Buffalo Police Department and the administration on this uh, because it's a problem not only in my district but throughout the entire city. I spent a lot of time this summer just dealing with uh, the business community and residents regarding these vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak on this item? Council Member Nowakowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did. I do see that we have Commissioner Kevin Helfer and we do have Corporation Council Karen Gordon on the line with us. I did send an email last Wednesday that identify two laws in which it appears uh, ATVs are governed by. And I did list about five legislative outcomes that this body um, would be you know, interested in, in, in seeking to remediate this issue. Um, and I will look to open up the floor to Commissioner uh, Helfer and Corporation Counsel, Karen Gordon. Uh, good afternoon, honorable members of the Common Council. Kevin Helfer, Commissioner of Parking, Executive Director of the Buffalo Traffic Violations Agency. Um, three things. Uh, number one, I have your resolution in front of me, and I certainly agree with increasing the fines. Uh, I think this is a problem just as you do as well. Uh, secondly, uh, any of these tickets uh, that are returnable to BTVA are not offered a plea deal. They are um, mandatory prosecutorial conferences with my prosecutor. And the third and probably most important, um, back a couple of weeks ago, we received a communication from Lieutenant uh, Macy of the Buffalo Police Department Intelligence and Special Investigations. And uh, we, we have changed our policy and we are not returning these ATVs uh, to the owners unless they are registered. So I think we've taken all the proper uh, provisions to um, show that this is uh, something that we, behavior we do not tolerate. Thanks, Commissioner. Just one question for the Commissioner. Um, if they're not registered, you don't return them. If they're not insured, are they, um, are you still holding on to them if they're not insured? Correct. Okay. Uh, only once have we had a case where 
it was before us in BTVA where the vehicle was roadworthy. Um, they have to meet a lot of criteria to be um, legally uh, on the road. Um, and that would be registration, insurance, and then meeting all the um, uh, laws as it relates to side view mirrors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, only once have we had a person that went to that extent to make their ATV roadworthy. Commissioner, uh, how many uh, vehicles would you estimate, just a rough estimate that you would have uh, impounded this year or, or taken? Are you talking vehicles in general or just ATVs? ATVs, dirt bikes, anything like that. Um, I'll get that for you in about five minutes, but uh, anytime that uh, uh, the police um, pull one over, they are impounded, they are brought to our, our yard and um, I would say it's becoming a significant number, but I'll get you that number. Okay, so it is increasing. And yes. Then, could I just ask uh, Captain Ronaldo um, regarding the the policy? If you pull an ATV or dirt bike over uh, on the streets in the city of Buffalo, is that automatically an impound? Is uh, the language clear for officers? Because in my experience, I've had situations where you know we've had ATVs cruising down Lovejoy Street you know, popping wheelies and I've, I've called for assistance and, you know, certain officers didn't feel comfortable that uh, the legislation supported impounding or taking the vehicle. So if you could just clear up what the policy is on that. Well, again, if you're driving an unregistered motor vehicle on a city street, that vehicle, regardless of what it is, is subject to being impounded. So I would say the majority of these vehicles, when we're able to detain them, are impounded and held said then in order to have them returned you have to meet the necessary guidelines the difficulty we have is a lot of people do not comply with pulling over when the police attempt to stop these and as we've seen throughout the entire summer uh, a number of these uh, people just take off from us there was a relatively lengthy chase with other agencies that resulted in numerous arrests being made in the city of niagara falls uh, some ATVs that had started off in the city wound up getting chased by, again, outside agencies, not us, and uh, eventually came to an end in Niagara Falls. And we've even went so far as to utilize uh, the Erie County Sheriff's Department helicopter to attempt to locate where these uh, vehicles stop and we're, we're able to try and curtail them and, again, issue summonses, make arrests when necessary, and impound the vehicles. Is there anything legislative we could do to support you further? I know in my district, I have a lot of cameras where, um, you know, we can put two and two together, to be honest. A, a lot of the times residents will call me and say, I know exactly where the ATV that was just driving down the street uh, is located and, uh, you know, where they're going back and, and leaving it. Would you be able to put two and two together with that and, and impound the ATV at that point? Well, and I'm not an expert on the legislation side of it, but I would say this, just like having an unregistered motor vehicle, you're prohibited by law from having that vehicle on uh, private property after a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. So I would say if there's any way to require a city registration of these, not necessarily where somebody is attempting to make it roadworthy, but if you live in the city, you own one of these vehicles, you're going to store it at your property, there should be some type of possible registration. If you're going to take it hunting, if you own property in the Southern tier, let's say, and you're using it strictly for recreational purposes, we don't wish to discourage that. But if it's not registered, you're probably not utilizing the manner in which it was intended. So the lack of registration would probably allow us to impound it much like an unregistered motor vehicle. But again, that would be a question for court counsel on the legislation side. But anything that you can afford us in terms of legislation they would allow us to not only summons people that are not abiding by this, but also would allow us to retain the vehicle until they've A, paid the fine, and then B, either properly registered it or disposed of it would be a great help. Exactly, okay, thank you. Do have questions? Uh, Council Member Bowman, I can uh, I can tell you that I just got a hold of my uh, coordinator at the impound. Um, it spiked in the in the nicer weather, uh, June July. Um, we've had upwards of fifty impounded 
Uh, and in one particular day in September, we had six at one time impounded. So uh, I, I really think that, uh, you know, BPD is doing, you know, everything they can. And, uh, you know, I absolutely agree with Mr. Ronaldo that, you know, anytime it's unregistered, um, you can see it, that they are bringing them into the auto impound. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Council President Pridgen. Yeah, just a quick question. What happens after we impound them? What does the city do with those vehicles? Well, first thing we have to do is make sure we run a, a VIN, make sure that it's a, a legal vehicle and identify ownership, which is not always easy, easy especially with some dirt bikes and things like that. Um, we notify the owner and with our new policy, we tell the owner that they have to make them roadworthy and register and insure those vehicles. And then does the owner get the, the vehicle back? Yes, if they can, if they can be in compliance with the new policy. What, what I'm saying is, you, we tell them that they have to make a role worthy, and then they just take them back, um, right? I mean, in the same condition that we picked them up. Um, what we what we tell them, maybe I wasn't clear. What we tell them is, um, they they'll come and say, you know, I'm here to pay my impound fees to get back our vehicle, and we say, um, no, not so quick. You cannot get your vehicle back until you go to DMV and show proof of insurance and register your vehicle. But can the uh, ATVs be registered, Commissioner? All of them? Some of them are not roadworthy, right? To be registered. Well, they, they could be made to be roadworthy is what I'm saying. Uh, they oh. would have to be made roadworthy and have to pass inspection. And if not, then what do we do with those vehicles? We will auction them. Okay. And okay. To city of Buffalo, I mean, city of Buffalo. What I guess what I'm trying to get to, could these end up being recycled right back out on the street? Mm -hmm. um, only if they, only if they're compliant. Um, they're not. If they can't meet the compliance standards, they will not be returned to the owner. But when we auction them, somebody from the city of Buffalo could, could Correct. get. Correct. And it's still not roadworthy, right? Correct. And I could change that policy as well as the commissioner. I do have the authority to. Um, only sell them to people with dismantler licenses. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else on this item? Yes, I have a question. Council Member Wyatt. Thank you. I'm Commissioner, well, Captain Ronaldo first. Captain, is there a chase policy in effect for the Buffalo Police regarding these vehicles? Yes, sir. Um, our chase policy is the same regardless of uh, any type of motorized vehicle. We, we basically have a, a no pursuit policy. The uh, situation has to meet a very, very specific set of criteria for our officers to be allowed to chase these vehicles. We've seen over the course of the summer people getting severely injured on these, even with no police involvement, just driving them in normal traffic, other vehicles are not looking for ATVs and people are slamming into cars, buildings, trees, fire hydrants. So to attempt to pursue them would just be extremely dangerous to both uh, the public, the person riding the ATV and the officers. Are, are you finding that there is, is more to it than just a nuisance of them using the vehicles um, just driving through the streets is because I was told that it was part of a criminal enterprise too, using them on railroad tracks and things like that. We see a lot of usage of them up on the rail beds, uh, obviously just trying to stay out of the street. Uh, I know, especially in D District along Hurdle Avenue, there's a few uh, train track areas and the CSX police uh, go up there and monitor it. Uh, we have seen crimes committed on ATVs. We have seen, uh, actually we had an officer shot at on an illegal dirt bike while pursuing somebody. So uh, some people are using them for illegal means, but the vast majority are just people that think that they can ride these things on city streets. And as a, another council member mentioned, they're doing it in large packs, which makes it uh, extremely difficult to enforce. Thank, thank you, Captain. Um, Commissioner, um, I know uh, we you were talking about taking them off instead of being on part of the auction. I think that it would be a good suggestion because again, the concern is they can be put back on the street and you go through the same problem again. So is that something that we have to do resolution or something that you can just do by policy? Um, I, I, I think that uh, I'll talk to the law department. I don't want to commit to 100% right now, but I do think that between the law department, the administration, 
and your honorable body, we can come up with a resolution to this to, uh, so that they don't get uh, returned uh, back on the street. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on this item? No, okay. This is, this is Commissioner Fenn, if I could uh, speak for one, one moment. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to add to some of the sentiments that have already been stated about uh, the uh, illegal uh, use of ATVs and dirt bikes uh, on city streets and, and even more notably in, in city parks. I, I spoke with uh, Deputy Commissioner Rabb uh, and he, he explained to me that it's a, a citywide problem. Uh, every corner of the city is seeing ATVs and dirt bikes uh, using city parks, which uh, does cause damage during the, the wet times, but um, it's a general nuisance and, and somewhat of a safety hazard to the other users of, of the parks during uh, times when we might not see, see rutting. Um, we have made, we've done a couple measures to try and prevent some of the more prevalent areas. Uh, we put up some uh, barricades uh, into the Hudson Street Bridge to prevent ATVs from going over that bridge into um, Centennial Park, which, which has helped a little bit, but uh, a lot of what we've done to date, I, I feel like is, uh, is, is maybe a whack-a-mole effort um, because what we, what we find is, you know, they leave the area that we secure and then just move to another one. So I think a, a holistic approach that, that you're starting to think about is uh, definitely do and uh, registering them is, is probably the, the best idea because then it'll get to people who want to be able to use them lawfully where they can lawfully uh, be used. Thank you. Thank you. Um, One Council last Member question. Bowman. Uh, thank you. I just, uh, to the commissioner, could we also look at Houghton Park? That's one, uh, they go behind the, the tracks back there in the fields and, and barricading that. Uh, those entry points would, would be helpful. I know uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Rapp has um, looked at that, but I would like to, you know, make that a, a priority too, because they, they are tearing up the park over at, at Houghton Park in Kaiser Town as well. So thanks, Commissioner, for your comments. Yep, thank you. And, and uh, Houghton is, a, is an ongoing effort. I, I, I feel like that's been one that we've been focused on uh, even before the, the pandemic when it has seemed to have gotten worse. Thank you. Thank you. Majority Leader Rivera. Uh, Commissioner, what is the penalty? Um, you, you seize the vehicle, you impound it, but what's the financial penalty besides the storage fee and, and the towing? Is there any financial fee um, that makes it even more difficult for them to uh, retrieve their ATVs or their two wheelers, whatever they are? Or is it something the Common Council has to do to, um, that is progressive if, if you get caught violating the vehicle and traffic law, if it's part of the vehicle and traffic law or any city ordinance that there's a penalty and that it's progressive because the cost to the Buffalo Police Department to send people, because I, I drive up and down Niagara Street, they have a detail on Niagara Street near Broderick Park, and they're paying police officers to keep these four wheel or three wheels out of the park that caused the damage. Um, so there is a cost to the city. And how can we um, make sure that they pay that cost? Well, in theory, the way it works is when you auction off a vehicle, you are recouping a lot of those funds. What we're talking about right now is not necessarily auctioning that vehicle off, but we're talking about dismantling it, which is basically destroying it, which is basically taking all its value away. Right. Um, I am not the law department. I see Ms. Lazarus and Ms. Gordon on the call, but I think that we would have to have a legislative solution to accomplish uh, what you are asking for, and I certainly would support that. All right. Thank you. Chairman, you're muted. Okay, um, this item is going to be tabled, um, motion to table by Majority Leader Rivera, seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Next item. The next items are on the table. 
Okay, take from the table item 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 27, 33, 34, 40, 41, 43, 44, 49, 55, 56, and 57. And also item number 23, seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Item number 16, special use permit 832 Tonawanda for tobacco sales, vape, and N3C zone. Motion to receive and file. Seconded by Council Member Golombek. Item number 17, special use permit 549 West Utica for tavern neighborhood shop in N2R zone. Motion open to public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. This item at 549 Utica is marked that Seth Aman has been invited to speak. Are you here, Seth? I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. I'm also, uh, I am the ar architect for the project and also here with the building owner, Fritz Abel, and the uh, two future um, operators of the potential business, um, Bridget and Joey. So if there's any questions that need to be expanded on, they're also here, um, should that be needed. Um, I, so I, just quick question. I, there was a, a visual package submitted. I don't know if that is shared or in front of you, or if you'd just like me to uh, speak uh, about the project. I will defer to a council member whose district this is in. I believe it's a majority leader of Rivera's district. Can you just give us a brief summary? Sure, not a problem. Uh, so uh, like I said, I'm the architect for the project and uh, this building is about one block uh, west of the Five Points uh, area, which uh, everyone's probably a little familiar with. Uh, Las Puertas, Remedy House, um, Urban Roots, uh, um, and Blue Table Chocolates, uh, Five Points Bakery, and more uh, exist in this kind of interesting little hub. Uh, Fritz Abel has been part of that um, rebirth and revitalization of that um, as well as many others. Uh, so uh, Fritz has bought this building and it has uh, been vacant or uh, highly underutilized and is pretty uh, bad shape currently for probably about 10 to 15 years. Uh, and uh, the plan is that we will go through a complete uh, renovation and restoration. And the, the hope is, um, and then why we are here today, is to restore the first floor to a more commercial use. Um, even though it is technically in a N2R residential district, we're right past the border of uh, the, that five points um, special use area. So uh, with that, the intended use is to uh, create a first floor artisanal pizzeria, uh, which we could expand on the hours if you have questions about, um, and with a second floor apartment above. Uh, all activity will uh, occur uh, on the inside, and we are here today to ask for a special use permit uh, to allow uh, wine and um, light alcohol to be served in the restaurant. I hope Seth, that's I a quick enough I, summary. Seth, uh, if I could just interject one. Yeah, um, I think it's important to note that the building had been used uh, for commercial purposes from about 1880 until 1960. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Majority Leader Rivera. Yeah, once the, the public hearing is um, done with, um, I would be supporting this project. Uh, Fritz Abel is one of the pioneers uh, in the Five Points area. We have seen that it has become a destination for many people throughout the city. They go down there to spend money with local businesses and um, some of these buildings are adaptive reuse buildings. They're doing great uh, restoring these buildings and bringing them back to life. So I'm a big uh, supporter of this project. Motion to close public hearing. Motion is to close the public. I'd like to speak about it if that's possible. Sure. sure. Cool. My name is Samantha Peterson Borens. I'm a resident at 593 West Utica. Uh, I've lived here for many years. Um, I think that there is a big problem with making this into a pizzeria. I've got six bullet points here. One, you're exploiting a loophole in the green code. The green code reads as if neighborhood shops are conforming in a retail sense. 
not in a restaurant and bar sense. It's not Allentown. Uh, two, this loophole neighborhood shops and N2R zones are considered conforming and alterations to the structure must conform to N2C. It allows for limited to no community engagement. Three, the traffic of the Five Points neighborhood has increased exponentially since Remedy House and the interesting little hub and revitalization has occurred. Uh, and local residents who live here and have lived here for a very long time do not go to Remedy House. They do not go to Five Points. They don't go to Butterblock. I can't afford a latte every day or an artisanal pizza. Uh, with the increase in people, parking on West Utica has become impossible, and not just West Utica, Rhode Island, Shields. Many homes on these streets don't have driveways, therefore we park on the street. It's alternate parking. You can't find a spot anywhere. Uh, four. Uh, parking traffic and residential disturbances associated with serving alcohol. Again, we're not Allentown. Children play and walk around. Now children who live in the neighborhood play pretty much only at night when there aren't people from that don't live in the neighborhood. Uh, five, it's a potential fire code issues with pizza ovens and a type five light wood framing and combustible building also immediately adjacent to other housing. Six, a total loss of affordability in the Five Points neighborhood. Buffalo is facing an affordability crisis. Councilmember Rivera, who, you, these are, this is your district, these are your people, and who are you? They're not gonna, re, it's not gonna reflect who you're representing soon. Um, just, five, just a couple days ago, a building that had four units in it, uh, a family was evicted that has lived in the neighborhood for 22 years. They have to move to Niagara Falls Boulevard as it's the only place that can afford $700 rent. So I ask you, what are we doing to protect renters in the Five Point neighborhood and low income homeowners? Uh, and my recommendation is that the owner of this building does community engagement and come back with a plan to mitigate community concern and or he needs to go through an entire zoning process and not go through the loophole. Thank you for your time. Uh, Thank Mr. You. Chair, I, I would ask uh, Mr. Fritz able to talk about the wine and liquor part of this. This is not a bar. Uh, would you speak to that? Sure. I, um, and I'd like to talk about a couple of other points as well, if I could, please. Um, but there are also yeah. two other people who would like to speak, just to be clear. Yes, yeah. I've gotten some messages from other speakers. So after, do you want to wait okay. till the, all of the speakers? And why don't we wait till the end, till all of the speakers, and then you can um, the presenters of this project will speak after those speakers. Um, I got a message from John who would like to speak on this item then. Oh. John, are you here? Uh, yes, um, I would like to speak on the item. I think that um, in the Five Points neighborhood, while there has been a lot of new business, those businesses are having some detrimental impacts uh, on that community. Uh, Sam spoke earlier about the evictions uh, we have seen, especially on West Utica um, and the streets surrounding there. Um, a lot of people, you know, buying up properties and, and while that may be good for business and tax revenue, um, ultimately like these evictions mean that, that the community is changing um, and really it no longer is a residential community. Uh, we have zoning laws for a reason. Right. Uh, this is not zoned to to be commercial and and in changing that the community should be engaged about how they feel about having it, even if it's not a bar where there is or isn't. Um, I think the sale of alcohol, especially to people who do not live in this neighborhood, um, you know, is something that is a serious concern. Um, I think even for, you know, selling alcohol to, to people who do live in the neighborhood. Um, and I think, again, the, the parking issues. Uh, and council member Pridgen, you know, can understand how the, the accumulation of businesses and of activity, especially in a neighborhood that small, is going to have a deep impact, especially when folks are, again, coming in from out, they're spending their money on certain businesses, um, but really they are affecting the conditions, uh, the way that people live in that neighborhood. And I think this is also a slippery slope. Uh, you know, once you have something that is in an area that is intended to be residential, there, there is a, a limit to the amount of commercial practices you want to have in that neighborhood before it no longer becomes a residential neighborhood uh, and before you know you're violating the the premise of the zoning law um, which is to maintain the the integrity 
of neighborhoods. Uh, and so for me, I see Five Points creeping into being an entirely commercial district uh, that pushes the already vulnerable residents of that neighborhood out. Uh, and I think that this, this loopholing, um, getting around, uh, having to acknowledge those things to the community and work with the community on potential solutions or, or, or possibly doing it in a different place, um, you know, just speaks to the fact that, that a lot of folks are much more concerned with how much money can be made in a neighborhood than with the integrity of the culture of the neighborhood with the history of the neighborhood and with the safety of the people who are there now. Okay, the next speaker we have is Sage. And Sage, now I can see your name right in front of your, your face on, on Zoom. So go ahead. There we go. Good. Um, so hi, my name is Sage Green. I am also a resident of the West Utica uh, block just before where um, this business is being proposed. Um, and I have a few points. I really appreciate what Sam has already said and what John has already said. Um, I want to expound on the idea that this was previously already a storefront and therefore it can go to this new use. It was previously a corner store. And when you look at the old pictures, it says they sold vegetables and food and cigarettes and tobacco. And it was your typical corner store in a Buffalo neighborhood, which are things that are severely lacking in our neighborhoods today. We know we know we've seen how food deserts have really hurt neighborhoods like this. And so if this were being proposed to become a corner store that served all of the people here and had typical nine to five hours, this might be a different conversation. But in the visual representation they sent, this looks like the Billy Club in Allentown and a transition from a corner store to a pizzeria is a very different use. Um, and so I just wanna make clear that although this was once a commercial space it was a very different commercial space one that was geared towards a neighborhood and towards community whereas we know living in buffalo who goes to pizzerias that serve wine and charge 13 dollars for a sandwich that most people especially these days can't afford to have on any regular basis if you live in this community um so i think there's a really big use question here um, I'll also say I'm a building science person. This building is less than a foot away from the buildings next to it, both of which are residential. One is a, I think maybe a three or four unit apartment building. The other is a very small home. And so we're putting what will serve wine and alcohol directly adjacent to two um, buildings that are residential. And it's also across the street from a lot of children. Um, there are not a lot of we don't have big yards here. And so kids tend to play in the street out front there. Um, and so this isn't, you know, a question of how will, how might this change things? It's a question of how will this immediately change the circumstances for the people who live in this neighborhood and the people who have been most underrepresented in these developments so far. Um, so the other points I wanted to make were um, unlike we, this area is not like Allentown. And if the city, if Rivera, your goal is to create a corridor here that attracts people from all over, this whole neighborhood needs to be ready for that change. We need to have parking conversations. This is immediately around the corner from a park that is frequented by children these days. Finally, it is finally used again. It's a great park. I think our kids are really excited to have it there. Um, parents as well, for being able to safely have somewhere to go, especially during quarantine. It's been, Mass Ave Park has been a huge asset. Um, and this is immediately around the corner from it. So selling alcohol in that area is complicated. It's not like Allentown. It's also very close to a public school. Um, and I think, you know, the Allentown reference is that Allentown hardware, if anybody's ever been, was a hardware store one day. And so it's not hard for us to imagine that this could turn into that type of development in Buffalo. Um, so since this is not, that we are not that community right now, I think community engagement is going to be incredibly important. Fritz, you've been developing in this neighborhood for a while now. Um, you own a number of buildings from Remedy House to, I've energy audited some, the yellow building that had tenants in it, the red building, the red home that has now become a frame shop. Like this is, you have a plan for how you're developing a community that you don't live in and that you are not from. And though it is considered micro development and I understand and I appreciate the value of not having to do huge block transitions at a time, it's, it is a false statement to say that you don't have a clear plan already for how you are developing this and that you are finding ways to not have to get the community engagement process fully vetted with the people who already live here to get to that end. And so I think it is really important to treat Fritz Abel and any of his development projects in this area like he's a larger developer. 
Um, and that doesn't mean that development can't happen. It means that development should go through a process. There should be full zoning variances that are pursued. There should be noise studies. There should be affordability studies. There should be transportation studies that are done so that we can make an informed decision as a community. Um, Fritz, I would like to know how, I'd like to know if you know, having been here this long, how many kids live on this block? How many families live on this block? And how many have you had a conversation with in the past year who don't frequent your stores, just people you've talked to? So if that's something you could answer at the end of this, I'd be really interested to know. Um, and then the last thing I just really wanna hit home is that um, solutions to things like parking are things that we are either going to decide beforehand or we're gonna run into huge issues later. There are ways other cities have dealt with these issues before you can have neighborhood parking. You can have areas that are designated not for people who are driving in to get pizza in the middle of the day or something like that. Like there are urban planning solutions to these problems. We have zoning variant, zoning laws for a reason um, and that this is a project in which we should absolutely utilize them. And I think Fritz, at this point, like you should expect the community to, to work with you on this project and you have to go to them and come up with a plan together. Otherwise you're just kind of doing weird shady deals that we all hear you talk about in Remedy House too. But like then they come in this setting and it's seen as like a little micro development. So I think these conversations need to be had in a larger setting with everybody involved. And I really appreciate the council for um, being involved on this project. And I'm hopeful to see this tabled until it moves forward with a full community engagement process and zoning variance um, analysis. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, um, are there any other speakers on this item? Okay, we're going, Fritz, we said we would go back to you um, after the other speaker, so you have the floor. Sure, okay, well, thanks everyone for your comments, and um, Sam and John, like, let's just identify you're from PUSH as well. You work for PUSH, so let's be clear about that. Um, I, um, I'll be quick, Esther. Uh, sorry, what was that? Sage, did you say something? Uh, John no longer works for Push, Mr. and Chair. I am Mr. off. The Chair. So we're going to have the instead of the back and forth in this committee, the questions are directed to the chair, and then the chair can go on to ask them. So we, if you can just um, sure. I'll, so, anyways, that I, I just wanted to make sure who we were speaking with. So. Um, I also want to make sure to identify um, the operators of, of the proposed uh, pizza pizzeria, Joey Pucciarella and uh, Bridget Murphy. They're on the line as well. And I'd, I'd like for you to hear a little bit more about their business. Um, so, you know, just addressing some of the points, um, you know, the history Actually, this was always a node of mixed use, this neighborhood. Um, it, it comprised a wide range of businesses. Um, it, it was um, mercantiles, it was corner stores, it was post office at one point, uh, the Remedy House mm -hmm. building had been a post, post office. So um, it had always been a mixed use neighborhood. And um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm actually, part of a consortium of people. I'm only one of a number of people who are working in the neighborhood to re-engage the node. And I and and um, I, I'm, I'm much more aware of the concept of um, gentrification than I was when I started all this seven years ago. Um, and I want to be clear about that. I've had I've had a number of conversations with people at um, PUSH, including, you know, um, Rawa and 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 uh, Jennifer or um, not Jennifer. I can't think of her name, but she was actually at Remedy House several weeks ago when we had this conversation about it. Um, I, I, so I am really aware of the issue of gentrification. I, I really firmly want to see revitalization. I don't think the problem is the success of the neighborhood. I think the problem is that it needs to be more inclusive. So actually my, my next project that I already started to engage with um, Andrew Del Monte and with and with, with Rawa, um, to um, look at a look at a more cohesive um, approach going forward, so that there are there is more representation of businesses. Um, it's not it's not wrong to have mixed use businesses, particularly in a building that had been commercial. Um, it wasn't always a a, a, um, a corner store uh, page. It was also um, 
it was uh, I can I can produce a list of the different uses. It it, it started being from 1880. Anyway, I I really actually probably do understand the concept more than you do. I'm not interested to, to I've never pushed anyone out of any of my buildings. The, 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 um, I am really firmly invested in seeing the neighborhood grow, the neighbor, neighborhood be diverse, the neighborhood be representative of a wide range of people. So I know I can be, I be, can be positioned as this, this evil developer. And I'm not saying you're necessarily doing that, but when, you know, the hit piece came out about Remedy House being gentrification station, you know, um, a lot of the business owners who are independent business owners, first time business owners, took real umbrage with that. Um, they're the ones who are setting up. They're the ones who are investing in the spaces. I make sure that my spaces are available and accessible to first time business owners. So that's a longer conversation. The parking, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I do think that this is a, a, a system-wide problem that we have to deal with as a neighborhood push as well as the the, the business owners. Um, I, 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 I can't be responsible for that. And uh, further, I am working with all of my tenants to make sure that they're pushing bikeability and, and, and walkability as much as possible. I think that this, act, this neighborhood becomes more successful the more dense it becomes. But let's not, let's not confine it to uh, car use. Let's look at, at pedestrian. Let's look at bikeability. Um, the neighbors, I, I actually sent a letter around to at least three neighbors on either side. I put um, them in all the mailboxes uh, about a month and a half ago, put my number there. I, I talked to the to the neighbor directly to the east. Um, I could never get anyone directly to the west. Um, I, they're all tenants. The landlord is is an absentee landlord. The tenant to the directly to the east couldn't be more supportive. I've got letters of support from almost every other business um, at the points, and um, I, I, I don't, I don't. So now, before I go any further, I, what I do want you to hear is a little bit about um, the business that's planning to be launched. Not the least of which is that it just is going through Push's Cooperation Buffalo program, um, which I think is a really important. Um, element of this of, of their model. So Bridget and Joey, would you mind speaking a little bit to your business? Absolutely. And thank you everybody for your concerns. Um, we definitely share a lot of those concerns. Uh, we are in the neighborhood. We live over on Rhode Island in 15th. So we see the terrible parking and all of the issues that you talk about. Um, but we are part of this community and another voice. Um, the main reason why we want to push this project forward is because we want to make our community better. Um, it You can't put it on a sign on the front of the building so it says artisanal pizza shop, but this is going to be a worker owned um, co-op business, a tipless business. Everybody will be paid the same wage from the dishwasher, the cooks, the server, the bartender, and Joey and I as the owners. Um, we We've worked in restaurants for, uh, I've worked in them for 15 years, Joey's about 10, and we know all the terrible problems that exist in restaurants and we really wanna to try to change that. Um, we are choosing to do it in our neighborhood where we live because we see it as a great opportunity to provide people in that neighborhood with good, good jobs. They can make a living wage and they can learn a lot of skills that can be transferred you know, further in their career if they so choose. Um, I know I completely agree with a lot of the concerns about we do not want to be an Allentown restaurant either. Um, we fully intend on being uh, closing much earlier. Um, there will be alcohol served, but it will always be with food. And then the other thing I really wanted to say was um, it says artisanal pizza shop, but the way that Joey and I see it is a uh, slice shop. So um, there will be slices to go. We're gonna have some soft serve ice cream, hopefully, so that everybody can enjoy, you know, you can go in and get a, an ice cream cone. The kids in the neighborhood can get an ice cream cone, grab a slice of pizza on your lunch break, grab pizza on your way home, you know, dinner for your family, or sit down and have a meal and have, you know, a glass of wine or two. Um, but we really do appreciate everybody's feedback and are taking that into account 
Um, as Fritz said, we are part of the uh, co-op academy this semester, and we've learned so much and hope that we can continue to work with Push and Andrew um, to be a better business. All right, thank you for your comments. Earlier in the meeting, we were having some technical issues and I failed to let everyone know that in this committee, we keep our comments to three minutes. And we started with this one, we were going over three minutes. So I didn't wanna, I wouldn't be fair to cut individuals off and not other individuals off. So for the remainder of the meeting, um, all the comments will be limited to three minutes. Majority Leader Rivera. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, uh, Sage and John. Um, brought up some points. Um, the question regarding, is this gonna be a bar in the middle or on the corner? I just want some clarification on your hours of operation. You mentioned that you would uh, serve um, um, wine or beer along with food. What are your hours of operation? We plan on being open um, Tuesday through Saturday Tuesday through Thursday's hours would be 12 noon to 10 p.m. And Friday and Saturday would be 12 noon to uh, midnight. Okay. Um, Abel, you mentioned um, uh, gentrification in neighborhood and you thinking about a project. Uh, what project is that you're thinking about? So um, Justin Smith and I, Justin is the co-owner of Remedy House, we own the uh, 450 Rhode Island, which is on the corner of 18th. Um, so that would be the next project. Um, and again, that would be mixed use. And that's the project that I've reached out to uh, Rawa at PUSH to discuss, um, you know, collaborating on. Okay. Uh, when you spoke to Rawa, did affordability um, come into question regarding what you're going to be charging? I mean, is there any, um, obviously there, push deals with affordable housing um, in order to keep people in the neighborhoods, it has to be affordable to them. Is, are you considering doing something that's affordable for people that are going to uh, be living in these projects? I would, I would love to. I mean, I, I am a, I'm a micro developer. I don't get any tax advantages. I don't get any sub subsidies whatsoever. So my ability to currently charge, um, anything subsidized is isn't available without you know so i think that's why i reached out to push to see if there's a way of of working together i, I don't really know how that would work but i wanted to get into a dialogue around it i you know my my partner on that project justin and i really would love to see a cross section of um tenants there i, I genuinely mean that um i i've lived in new york city for for 25 years, I've watched New York become completely inaccessible um, to a wide range of people. And I really don't want to see that happen. Um, you know, I'm not gonna go into it on this forum because it's too long, but I, I can talk to you about the number of, of, of ways that I've worked with my tenants to help them try to keep what they're doing accessible and diverse and talk to them about their hiring practices. That was one of the first things that Joey and Bridget and I sat down and discussed was, you know, I, I was, this is obviously a real concern for the neighborhood. And I, I wanted to be very sure that the type of businesses that they're, they're launching is in consort with where, where the neighborhood needs to go. Okay. Well, um, we did a study um, and what came from the study was to bring affordable housing into our stronger neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are, are transitioning uh, to make sure that those neighborhoods are reflective of the people that live there. So I would like to work along with PUSH and I have. I mean, the, the folks that are on the screen right now know that I have worked with regards to affordable housing and inclusionary zoning. Um, I've worked on the playground, the playground that you mentioned, we set aside money to rehab that, that playground uh, to improve it. So many of the things that you're talking about, we've already started working on and we'll continue to do that. And I'd like to see a affordable component in our strong neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are coming back, like Five Points, like Elmwood, uh, like Niagara Street, I'd like to see affordable housing, and we'll continue to work on that. Um, I'm what I'm proposed to do is I'm going to send this without recommendation for a vote on after we close the public hearing for a vote at our next common council meeting. In between, if uh, if the folks that are here would like to meet with 
uh, Fitzable and Seth, you're more than welcome to meet with them. If you'd like me to be there, I'll be glad to be there as well. Um, but right now we're gonna close the public hearing and we're gonna send it without recommendation. Motion to close public hearing, seconded by council member Scanlon. Motion to send without rec, seconded by council member Golombek. Next item. Item number 18, special use permit 149 Farmer for neighborhood shop, food store, and N2R zone. Motion to open a public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Glumbeck. This item is in North District, and the agenda says Byron Brewer is here to speak on this item. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Byron Brewer. I'm the CPA for the applicant. And what the applicant would like to do is just reopen the location as it previously was used back in 2004 as a meat fish poultry deli. Won't be any cooking, but um, it'd be uh, like a, a delicatessen. No cooking, just serving meat fish poultry, um, fruits and vegetables, canned goods, uh, pop, there'd be uh, no cigarettes or anything like that. Um, Previously, in 2004, that's what it was. So, just looking to bring it back into use for the residents of the community. Mr. Chair? Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Fairletto had to step away. He asked that I take over the meeting for a few minutes. So, Councilmember Vaughn might give the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know that I've received a couple of phone calls from residents who have some concerns about parking and with the delicatessen um, being there. Um, to Karen Gordon and the law department, um, or the law department, I'm not sure who's representing them today, what exactly do they need from the city of Buffalo in order to open at that location? Hi, um, good afternoon. Karen, go ahead. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Good afternoon, this is Karen Gordon, Assistant Corporation Counsel. Um, usually this would be uh, like a neighborhood shop. And this, I do believe would come under our section 11.3.3, uh, um, special use permit of the code. Um, so I believe that's where we should be looking in terms of um, standards, rules and regulations that would apply to this, um, 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 this deli. Thank you. Okay. Um, to the gentleman here that's representing them, is this going to be just a, a you know a, a typical corner delicatessen? Or I have uh, in Riverside, I think four different uh, Burmese specialty um, delicatessens that have opened up that sort of cater to different communities: the Karin community, the Chin community and things like that. Do you know um, what the owner is looking to do, if it's just going to be generic stuff or if it is going to be, uh, you know, geared towards any of the new immigrants or anything else uh, uh, like that? I believe it's going to be a general store, but I can certainly, you know, speak with the applicant to see if there's going to be a, any type of specialty or focus uh, or, or any type of, um, you know, primary uh, customer base he's looking to uh, you know, appeal to. I can certainly find that out, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you. If you could, I would appreciate that. Um, I don't have any other further questions at this time. Okay. Is there anyone else, anyone else to speak on this item? Majority Leader? Motion to close public hearing. Motion is to close the public hearing. Second of my Council Member Golombek. Refer to Council Member Golombek. Yeah, could we uh, could we send this without recommendation? Uh, I'll get a little bit more information between uh, now and next week. Um, and Karen, I had a question for you about it later that I'll get in touch with you. Thank you. Motion okay, is to send sure. without recommendation. Motion is to send without recommendation, seconded by Council Member Glumbach. Item 19, special use permit 430, AKA 436 grant for open air market in N2C zone. Motion open to public hearing. Motion is open to public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Is there anyone here to speak on this item? Hi, uh, my name is Bob Doyle. I work with Weedy. Um, 
we are we already rent the building um, our goal is just to be able to do pop-ups in the parking lot so that the business owners from Westside Bazaar are able to um, basically use it as an outdoor market since the bazaar is still closed to the public so and this is in this is on Grant it's in Niagara District, yes. Okay, I, I have no objection uh, to it. I've seen them uh, this summer doing some of the open air market uh, sales that are going on. So it brings some density people to the district to spend money. So I'm in support of it. Motion to close the public hearing. Motion is to close the public hearing, seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Motion to approve. Motion is now to approve, seconded by Council Member Golombek. Item 20, special use permit 1122 hurdle for tavern and outdoor dining in N3C zone. Motion open to public hearing. Motion is to open a public hearing, seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. And uh, Cedric Justice is here to speak, I believe. Yes, I am here with my partner, Karma. Um, we bought a bar. We're planning on reopening it as a bar. <laughs> and this is in the... Delaware District, I believe. Yes. Hurdle. Yeah, um, Council Member our uh, Council Member Fairletto did have to step away for a moment, so I think what we could do is probably um, close the public hearing and send it without recommendation for next week. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Glombeck. So does that mean we have to wait another week? Do we come back well, next week? Well, Either way, it would come out of this committee to a full vote at next week's full council meeting. So right now we are sending it to that meeting just without a formal determination because again, the district council member did have to step away for a moment. So it's following the same process as it would have should it be approved right now. We just can't attach an approval without speaking to him right now. Okay, okay. that makes sense. Cool, thanks. Thank so you. moving down the same path. Pardon? So it's still heading down the same path. Got it, Great. got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Motion is to send without recommendation, seconded by Council Member Glombeck. Item 21, special use permit 2381 Fillmore for self storage facility in N2E zone. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Glombeck. Uh, Greg Scholard is here to, uh, to speak with us about this item. I'm not seeing him, but I did see his name earlier. He might be on mute. Yeah, sorry, just unmuted myself. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Greg Scholand on behalf of Buffalo Self Storage LLC. I'm a land use attorney for the project. Uh, we are proposing to repurpose the existing building at 2381 Fillmore Avenue, which is the former Kaufman Bakery <laughs> building, uh, into a self storage facility. Uh, we've already been before the ZBA for a, an area variance because a self storage facility is an allowed use in the N2E zoning district where we're located, but the self storage units cannot be on the first floor and we're proposing first floor self storage units. That uh, variance was granted last month by the ZBA and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Um, this is in the Maston district. Um, if Council Member Wingo would wish to speak, you could have the floor. Yeah, send us without rec. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to ask the applicant to please reach out to my office so that we can have a conversation before next week, Tuesday. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Motion to send without rec. Seconded by Council Member Golombek, and the chairman has returned. Next item. Clerk. I was muted, I'm sorry. Item 23, Zoning Map Amendment 39, Coit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am going to be moving this without recommendation. Uh, the applicant is having a meeting tomorrow with the neighborhood um, or residents within close proximity tomorrow at noon. So I will be making a motion to our without recommendation. Uh, did you skip over item 22? If we see over an item, why don't we close this item out and then we'll return to that next. Thanks, right. Leader. Uh, what did the council member wish to do with that item? 
Motion to send without recommendation. Without rec seconded by Council President Pridgen. Item 22, special use permit 413 Sherman. Motion to approve with conditions. Mr. Mr. Chair. Seconded by Council President who has the floor. I think the architect was supposed to be on the call for this project. Okay, is the architect for 413 Sherman on this call? All right, we, we can send it. Um, if he's not on, I was informed he was supposed to be on to show the uh, drawing. So basically this is the Sherman Street uh, church that had the chimney that uh, preservationists wanted to stay. Uh, working with the architect and with the church, they are actually going to incorporate now the chimney into the first design so that the uh, residents, I just wanted to make sure the residents know that, uh, that we worked hard uh, on that. So uh, I'm fine with approving it now because it won't be a chimney just standing there um, by itself with hope for future development. So the architect did move that. So it would, it, I'm moving for approval without them, I mean, with them submitting it uh, to the council for next Tuesday's meeting, formally submitting that redraw. So approve with conditions. Okay, approve with conditions, seconded by Council President Pridgen. Item 27, local landmark 438 Walden Ave. Motion open to public hearing. Seconded by council member Noah Kowski. Um, Diane Sabateri is on the agenda to speak on this item. Diane, are you here? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, um, I serve as a volunteer president of the Concordia Foundation and I'm honored and pleased to be with you today. I am also here with our um, uh, volunteer Public Information Officer, Bonnie Fleischauer, who was the author of a wonderful article that was just published in Western New York Heritage Magazine on Concordia, uh, where every stone tells a story. Um, I know you had our extensive application uh, to review, so I'll be short and let you know that um, of course, Historic Concordia Cemetery has long been a part of Buffalo's history since 1859. Uh, in 1879, there were 41 cemeteries in Buffalo. Today, there are only four left. So uh, to that end, um, we are very honored to be caretakers. In 2001, the cemetery, as, as I know many of you, especially President Pigeon, <laughs> and Mitch Nowakowski um, understand that it was abandoned and the city did not uh, assist in taking care of that. And the grass grew to four feet in length, uh, 15 acres. So it was very difficult for us volunteers when we finally stepped forward and established a board to start taking care of it. Um, it was very difficult journey and has been. But in 2006, we were, um, applied for, uh, uh, for um, a site as the national and uh, state historic site. And now we are asking for a local landmark status because we finally have researched the house. And the farmhouse is the original farmhouse that in 1859 was on the property. Uh, the barn as well. There are a uh, very small amount of our pre-Civil War housing is left in Buffalo, but we are also proud to have a working barn there as well. So uh, we would like to have the status to continue on with our strategic planning to someday uh, work towards having this house and barn um, as a community place as well for our neighbors. We um, are currently uh, researched all the way back to the original owner, Eli Hart, uh, one of the uh, first settlers to Buffalo, New Amsterdam, in fact, and um, for all the owners since. We do not have the exact date that it was built, but we know it was there as the city engineer at that time, Gustavus Cozy, uh, did the map and shows the house and the barn there. It was subsequently moved when Genesee Street became Walden Avenue. And um, so we are continuing to um, look for the builder of the house. 
uh, the people at rest at Concordia, and I know you have our, our extensive um, uh, application that was also with the national and state, but they were not the famous or rich, but they built Buffalo and they have the same stories to tell. And these stories in their tombstones exemplify the historic, the aesthetic, the architectural and the educational, economic and cultural heritage of our city. And I appreciate the comments. If I you only can, get three minutes, I know. If you can I just know. wrap it up and then we will, if you want to submit anything additional to the council. No, just, I think you have more than enough. Okay. And, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else to speak on this item? Council member Nowakowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, as the district council member for Concordia. Um, I have worked uh, with Diane very well. They are great stewards to the cemetery. They work very hard to maintain, um, you know, that cemetery and the stories. I've been there when folks have even, you know, during cleanups have come and, you know, asked for assistance in locating a tombstone or, or, or um, you know, a headstone. Uh, so I do support this and I would like to move this with um, an approval if I make it a second. Council President Pridgen. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'd like to second that. Um, I have been involved, I was involved uh, with the cemetery. Matter of fact, the church was gonna take it on at one point because nobody would touch it with, as a labor of love. I'm really glad they came along and did that because I think it would have been a long-term labor of love, uh, but uh, have so many members from when I first started pastoring. Uh, this was one of the most affordable cemeteries uh, that people could go to and and be buried. And so I'm just so thrilled that they're not trying to mothball it, that they are trying to keep that wonderful house that was there. And as everybody knows, well, many people know, when I got to the council, I wasn't necessarily a preservationist. I was one of those, let's knock down everything and put it up with shiny new stuff and LED lights. Uh, but thanks to people like uh, Council Member Franzak and Council Member Golumbeck, um, and others who helped me to understand the value of those buildings. So I agree with the district council member wholeheartedly. This, this should go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Motion to close the public hearing. Seconded by council member Nowakowski. Motion to approve. Seconded by council president Pridgen. Item 28, special use permit 671 Fillmore for alcohol sales in N3C zone. Motion to open the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski, whose district this is in. Anyone to speak on 671 Fillmore Avenue? Uh, please still keep, still keep this table. Motion to close the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Motion to table. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Are we going back to item 33 that was held in abeyance? Yes. Okay. Item 33, amend zoning map amendment for 259, 267, 352 Mystic. Motion reopened. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Who has the floor? Mr. Chair, I believe we are now joined by the applicant, if he wishes to speak at this time, Mr. Ratatouli. He is muted. Okay, Mr. Radatovich, if you could unmute your computer or phone, please, or if it's on our end, if, if we can unmute him. We are sending the signal to unmute. It's not controlled on our end. He has uh, personally elected to mute himself. All right, well, we might have to hold an abeyance again if we can't figure this out. Hello. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble getting through here. I'm getting uh, interrupted by uh, um, the recording. Like, um, I'm the owner of the, the three parcels, and they've been in the family since the early 1950s. All three parcels zoned as M1 light industrial commercial. And probably a year and a half ago, two years ago, they were cho changed from uh, the M1 light industrial to residential without any notification to myself or my adjoining neighbor, Tom Price, who was also 
on the phone will be coming up shortly. Um, and I'd like them put back the way they were because we've been paying taxes on these properties since the early 50s, since my dad had owned them under the commercial uh, listings. And that's what I'd like to do is put them back the way they were. Mr. Chair. Major or President Pro Temp Scanlon. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the meeting, this was um, this is an attempt to correct um, a change in zoning that took place during the, uh, the green code process. This was not um, a change in policy or anything like that. It was more um, just a correction that needs to be made. Um, I know that there were uh, statements provided to the council from the public that I believe a staff that they wanted to have read into the record. And we have a staff member that was going to read them very quickly. Yes, Nina, if you could go ahead on the statement we prepared. Okay. Uh, the first one is from Davilin M. Steith. Apologies if I messed that name up. Dear Council Member Scanlon, I am writing you this letter in regards to the possible rezoning the area known as, quote, Hickory Woods. The area being considered for rezoning consists of Bell Avenue, Beacon Street, and Mystic Street. We are asking that this area remain as residential. My family and I live next to the area, and she lists her address. Our property touches 8 Bell Avenue, which is one of the lots being considered. This causes great concern because we have a family of five, and part of the reason we purchased our home was due to the location. We moved to this area in December 2019, and we have observed young families throughout the neighborhood. Also, one of the best characteristics about this neighborhood is the wildlife that we can observe and interact with. Some of the animals we have in this area are deer and turkey, just to name a couple. This is not only beautiful, but also educational for all our children. We were informed that this land was, quote, accidentally switched from commercial to residential. Also, we were told that the current owner just wants it listed as commercial, but does not have plans on changing the way the land is now. However, we are very concerned with the possibility of this switch and what the future may hold. A few problems brought up red flags for us. One reason was the fact that residents of this area were not officially told about the possible reason. Legally, the residents were to get notice via mail. However, none was given. The way we found out was by noticing some postings on the land, which did not give much information. When we called the council member's office, your office, on Monday, 9-28, we were when we first noticed signs, we were told by Jeremiah that there was no information on file and they would get back. I then proceeded to contact the city. I was given, sorry, Mr. I then proceeded to contact the city. I was given the name of Angela Weber, whom was not in the, in the office and asked that I email her. I did so on Monday. By Wednesday morning, I still have not heard anything. I again called your office to which Jeremiah again told me the same story and said he would get back to me. Come Friday, I still did not hear anything from anyone. I told, I took the time to call your office again, to which I was told by Rachel that there was a meeting to be held on Tuesday, October 6th in regards to this matter. And she would get back to me on how we can voice our opinions because it would be via Zoom. In the meantime, I tried to contact Angela Weber again and also included John Fell from the city. Angela proceeded to respond stating the meeting will be held on Monday, October 5th at 4 p.m. This information is conflicting. We should not have had to contact so many people just to get an answer of what was going on because we should have been legally notified from the start. It seems to us that there is something that you nor the city wanted the residents to know about. I will again bring up the fact that we were told the initial switch was an quote accident. This is irrelevant. We were not told how long the land was considered quote residential prior to this. Plus it makes no sense that it would have to be officially going through a hearing if it was accidental. Was it accidentally switched over to residential in a hearing? Again, it makes no sense. Regardless, the area considered residential and should remain that way for the safety of our children, cleanliness of the neighborhood, and protection of the wildlife. The council's office proceeded to try and make me feel better by stating the owner does not want to change the property, just how it is zoned. This does not make us feel better. 
At some point, the property will be switched to a new owner. At this point, the new owner will have free reign to do what they want with the property. This could potentially lead to a business that could potentially bring in a company that might bring with it rodents or unhealthy items to the neighborhood. Also, it can lead to unsafe conditions on our street with an increase in traffic to this commercial company, such as broken streets due to heavy traffic, while also taking away safe places for our children to play without having to worry about heavy traffic. It is bad enough that we are having to fight the potential of having our neighborhood taken over by proposed rerouting of the Skyway, but now we have to worry about the owner potentially causing harm to our quiet and safe neighborhood. It is unacceptable and we are asking that it not be considered for the benefit of the neighborhood. It is your job as a council member to hear the voices of your residents you represent. While your residents are asking you to fight for us and not allow the expansion of permanent commercial business in the area. I will forward your office a copy of a neighborhood petition on Monday, October 3rd. Thank you, Devlin. Thank you, uh, Majority Leader, or, I'm sorry. Councilmember Scanlon, are there other items you wanted read in the record or can we, are we filing them? What would you like to do? Um, we can file them with the council as a matter of public record. Okay, so I would instruct the, I would like to instruct the clerk to the council staff to give those items to the clerk and we'll file those for a public record. And council members can remember the yeah. poster. Yeah. Um, just to clear a couple of things up, there was in fact a clerical error um, and the surrounding neighbors were not notified of the initial public hearing. That is why we rescheduled it for today. And as far as the confusion regarding the different dates of the initial public hearing, that's because one was for the planning board and one was for the common council. I mean, one was the public meet, the pu actual public hearing that would take place in front of the council versus a public meeting at the planning board. Um, so that's why there may have been some confusion. There was there's no um, intentional misleading of the residents in any way. But again, um, and uh, this situation is not the only time this has happened. We've discovered through the green code. I know it's not happened just in my district, but in some other districts, people have had to apply to have uh, corrections made to the rezoning. So if we could go ahead and move this without recommendation, we can deal with this next week finally. Motion to close the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Motion to sign without recommendation. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Next item. Item 34, amend zoning map for three beacon, 180 Germania, 8 bell. Motion to reopen the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon and John Price. Are you here to speak on this item? Either John's not here or muted. Uh, Council Member Scanlon, do you want to give us a brief summary of this? These are adjoining properties to the previous item, and it's the same situation. This is a, an attempt to correct a change that was made during the green code of changing them from light industrial to residential. Um, I believe Mr. Price, he was on here. I'm not sure if he still is. Mr. Price was connected, but it appears he had to leave. He is no longer on the line. Um, so we can, if you want, Majority Leader, you could close the public hearing and uh, send it without recommendation, please. Motion to close the public hearing. Seconded by Councilmember Scanlon. Motion to send without recommendation. Seconded by Councilmember Scanlon. Item 40, Michigan Sycamore Historic District. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. All right, I believe there's at least um, at least a couple of people that are here to speak on this item. Um, Christiana, if you want to go first and then we'll go from there. Again, I'm Chris, thank you very much. I'm Christiana Lamiatis, Director of Preservation Services for Preservation Buffalo, Niagara. The item before you is a landmark application to expand the Michigan Sycamore Historic District to include 63, 67, and 77 Sycamore, as well as 578 and 582 Michigan. The Michigan Sycamore Historic District was first established in 2017, landmarking 68 and 72 Sycamore, and then was subsequently expanded in 2019 to include 82 Sycamore and 608. Eight, Michigan. The current application before you um, includes the properties on the southeast corner. Of As detailed in the application, much more details. Uh, they represent the history of the city writ large, buildings ranging from pre-Civil War to the 1920s, buildings built and occupied by immigrants and tradespeople, and one building built by Louise Bethune's famed firm. 
given the significance, and again, in much more detail in the application, these structures included in the proposed expansion meet um, the landmarking uh, provisions in section 337 of the Buffalo City Charter um, and meeting the same criteria for designation as the historic district existing, namely criteria one, three, and five. Um, it is incredibly important to understand that this nomination was submitted as part of our continued work to support community partners by advocating for the preservation of the historic built environment of the Michigan Street African American Heritage Corridor, a designated New York State Heritage Area since 2007. The purpose of the New York State Heritage Area Program is to quote, develop, preserve, and promote all the state's cultural and natural resources as an expression of our state's heritage. Establishing and expanding the Michigan Sycamore Historic District is not only in accordance with the criteria listed in our local preservation ordinance, but carries out this vision set forth by New York State. Recommending the landmark application is a strong statement that we as a community see these buildings, see this corridor, and the history and culture it represents as an important part of our historic built environment. Despite the incredible significance and state level designation that this corridor has, it has been disproportionately affected by out of town speculators and racist disinvestment. The destruction results, the destructive results of those forces um, have only benefited those outside of our community. Recommending this landmark application ends that status quo bias. Recommending this landmark application prioritizes the values of this community and provides protection to ensure that members of this community and not speculators control the future of this very special place in our city. Um, this nomination to expand the Michigan Street Historic District has wide community and resident support included in your nomination packet, packet and several people in, here are, are ready to speak as well, um, include letters of support from Assembly Ma Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes, Terry Alford, the Executive Director of the Michigan Street African American Heritage Corridor, former Common Council President George K. Arthur. Additionally, as of this morning, we've had over 120 people sign in support of this nomination on our online advocacy portal. Of those individuals, 99 live in the city of Buffalo and 55 are specifically from the zip codes um, that make up Ellicott District where this nomination is located. It's also important to mention that we at PBN aren't just advocates in this mission, uh, in this uh, uh, issue. Well, we are also a neighborhood property owner. Uh, we own the already landmarked 78, uh, 72 Sycamore, and we are in the process of rehabilitating uh, that building to provide low, uh, low income housing units and as well as nonprofit offer space for heart of the city. Um, if, you so can that, just, if you can just do your final point. That was literally my last thing to say. <laughs> and I hope that I can address any questions that the council members have or other things that are brought up by other speakers at the end. Thank you. Um, other speakers on this item. Hello, uh, my name is Terry Alford, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'm the executive director of the Michigan Street African American Heritage Corridor Commission. So thank you, Christy, uh, for introducing us. I'm here today with our commission chair, George Scott, as well as our project manager, Audrey uh, Clark. The commission serves as the connector of the past, present, and the future for the historic neighborhoods within the Heritage Corridor. One of our core principles, and we have many, is maintaining the historic integrity of this corridor. Our corridor is a nationally and internationally recognized neighborhood that serves as the, as the focal point of residents and visitors' experience for, for learning about Buffalo's rich African-American history. But we also use opportunity to acknowledge the contributions of other ethnic groups that, uh, that make great contributions to our city as well. Many of which were German, Polish, Italian, and Irish immigrants at the turn of the 20th century who settled along this heritage corridor, specifically, especially around the Michigan Sycamore area in question today. Even before this pandemic, the heritage corridors, festivals, cultural events, and artistic programming has drawn residents, natural and international tourists, scholars and artists, writers, storytellers, poets, dancers, and actors to a thriving community of historic urban scale. The commission will soon be announcing that after a nationwide search, it has selected a consulting group of record who will be assisting in the development of a massive strategic action plan for the corridor that will further develop it economically, culturally, 
and socially, thus making this corridor more than just an important heritage center or living museum, but as a vibrant place to live, work and play. In closing, the commission fully supports the historic district designation status for those last and existing structures in the Michigan Sycamore area of our corridor. I want to make it perfectly clear that we are not anti-developer or development. However, in keeping with our mission and our core principles, we as a commission is fully committed to and always attentive to ensuring what might be constructed, renovated, or expanded upon in many of these unique, beautiful spaces stay within the confines of historic integrity. It is especially important to preserve, protect, and promote these spaces like Michigan Sycamore for those generations that will follow uh, us. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and uh, open up to uh, any questions that you may have of us. Hello, my name is Dan yes. Cephaleta. Yes, um, so my name is Dan Cephaleta and I am the owner of a property at 77 Sycamore, which is included in this application. So first of all, um, I take great umbrage um, at Preservation Buffalo's Niagara's insinuation that we own this property as a matter of speculation. Um, my dad, who grew up at, at uh, Eagle, in, Eagle in Michigan himself um, in Buffalo, and my grandparents lived there when they came from Italy, um, my dad has owned this property for many years. It's been leased. It's been um, a usable as well as a contributing factor to the neighborhood. So to say that we are because we're opposed to this, that we're um, out of town speculators is ludicrous. So my second point that I'd like to make is that I believe that there has been a clerical error with this public hearing. Okay, as a property owner, according to city code 337-7, I should have received a registered letter from the city of Buffalo notifying me of this hearing 15 days prior to the actual hearing. Um, I did not receive this letter. It was a first class mail that was sent to me, which I received exactly six days prior to this hearing. So I question A, whether the rest of the property owners have been notified um, of this public hearing. And it also says that the secretary should publish a notice of public hearings in an official newspaper 15 days before, before this hearing. So I would like to ask, where is the clerical information that supports that this hearing is happening as the law says it should. And finally, I completely disagree with Preservation Buffalo Niagara's um, criteria for inclusion. The property, my property in particular, is a gas station that sits on the corner of Sycamore in Michigan. It is a nondescript building of no particular architectural value. There is nothing historic about it. And while yes, I mean, there may be historic homes or other properties around it, um, I don't believe that my property is historic, nor does it meet the criteria. So my request at this point is, is that this be stopped um, because it's being railroaded without public involvement. And with all due respect to the African-American Heritage Quarter, I've re reached out to Terry. I've reached out to President Buffalo Niagara. I've worked with Gwen Howard on the President Board. Never, with the exception Involved to the people and that this they have to be adjusted. What the uh, when the public from the app. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on this item? May I address some points, please? The Council President Pridgen has the floor. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, several things. Uh, number one, portions of, um, of what was said uh, by the last speaker was correct. I, I believe I was informed uh, from staff that um, there was a problem in the mailing I just want to state for the record, if there's a problem, I don't mind us saying there was a problem. So what our intentions were 
or R is to, um, once this hearing is over, to table it so that uh, people, if there's someone else that has, that wants to weigh in uh, and ensure that uh, those property owners, uh, the other property owners did get a notification, but I, I, I do want to be fair in this process um, and ensuring that the property owners have uh, been duly uh, served as we do for any other public hearing. So it, after after hearing the comments, then I'll uh, kind of sum up uh, my thoughts on the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, are there any other commenters for the first time? If not, we will go back to Christiana and then to Council President. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to say two things in regards to meeting the criteria. It is not my criteria. It is the criteria that was written into the law. Um, as the previous expand, uh, nominations have gone, we are finding that these resources meet those same criteria that the other, uh, the original historic district and the expansion were you agreed with in those hearings that they did successfully meet those criteria. The wonderful thing about preservation is, is that it is not just about the capital H historic buildings, those grand, beautiful things that we love to talk about. It is also about our vernacular architecture. And these, this block represents one of the last complete portions of intact row buildings, an intact row of original architecture on this street. Um, so these are very significant vernacular structures. To the conversation about notification, obviously I am not the city, I can't speak to what was notified and whether or not the law was filed, followed through that certification process. I Say that we at PBN took the initiative to personally notify every single property owner in this district back in February before we even submitted this nomination. With the other property owner, the other major property owner in this district, I spoke to personally way back before the pandemic, explained everything with them. They had no issues with it, and then they have not participated in this process since then. I know that the gentleman who spoke earlier did speak to uh, PBN. He did speak to uh, the preservation board representatives. Um, again, that uh, everyone who has been, all of the property owners affected with this property have been notified since February that this application was submitted under review and going through the process. Um, I understand that legally, if we have to table this matter because of the required notification hasn't met, but I do want to say that this has been now stalled twice because of this property owner's claim that he was not notified. I find problem with allowing a delay in this public process when you have the overwhelming community desire to move forward with this um, and uh, notification has been made several times that this process was continuing. Thank you very much. And if I'm, if I may, Mr. Chair, just quickly. Um, no, the chair has to recognize you. Hold on, sir. Oh, yes. Any other, if you wanted to reply with your comments and then we're going back to the council president to, um, to discuss any items in closing. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. President. Uh, just quickly, just as a matter of clarification to the gentleman, I'm sorry he broke up a bit, but I couldn't hear everything he said, but I did hear that he did say that he reached out specifically to me and we did correspond at which point I explained to the gentleman that we were in the process of identifying a consultant to help with our strategic action plan. And I, in fact, indeed invite, invited him at that point to participate in the process. So I just wanted that on the record. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I would like to go on the record to yeah, say that, but, yes, no, you did no, contact no. me, but sir, I've never, I've you never heard anything sir. from you since speaking. All right, so um, Mr. Chair, if I have the floor. Council President. Uh, all right, so several things. I, this back and forth of whether it's notified, um, I've already taken care of that because at the end of the day, the city has a legal, um, we are supposed to notify and we want to make sure that he was notified. That that's that's not a hard lift uh, to say that this has been um, uh, delayed because of that. That that's not not correct. We had a a legal right. If we did not uh, meet that legal right, period. Now I support. I want to be clear. The landmarking. So to go in a back and forth is is just a waste of time. Um, but I do have a question so that I have clarification because if the gas station is included in this, does that mean that the gas station cannot change significantly the outside of the gas station as it is now if this legislation passes, if we move forward? For me to answer, sir? Yes. 
No, it, it, the landmark leg uh, legislation does not prevent any changes to landmark buildings. There are nearly 4,000 landmark properties in the city of Buffalo. It does not prevent them or future landmarks from being able to change. All it means is that those exterior changes to the property also then have to go through that preservation board review, just like they would have to get a permit right. or approval. So it would have to go through review. And this is the, my only concern. And since the gentleman is on, that gas station looks horrendous. It's nasty. It's in the historic corridor. It needs renovation. It needs a lot of attention. I don't know of one neighbor over there who is saying hooray for that gas station continuing to look like it does. It's horrible. Um, complaints upon complaints about the gas station. So I do welcome um, his comments because this is a public hearing, but I want to be clear. I'm not thrilled about that gas station, that condition of that corner. So if the owner, if this passes and goes through with that property and the owner wanted to make renovations, would he have to meet a certain criteria and hopefully he'll make some renovations to that building? Um, what, what criteria would he have to meet in order to make res uh, renovations? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure I don't speak out of turn. Uh, Christiana of Preservation of Buffalo Niagara. Uh, this criteria used by the Preservation Board is the same criteria used for by every other Preservation Commission in New York State and the country. It's the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. Um, this city staff person, Chris Hawley, who was assigned to the Preservation Board, is more than capable to walk him through how that standards and guidelines work and how to apply that to any proposed project. We at PBN can certainly provide advice, but that is the document you would use to guide your work. Okay. I just want to make sure it doesn't have to stay in the state that it is in right now. No, no, and no. And that it can be renovated. Yes. We would encourage improvement of all of our historic properties. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in summary, um, I am in support. Um, I will leave this at this point, I should say, because um, it would be unfair to uh, not have an open ear in case there's other uh, sides of the coin uh, that people want to bring to me. I would say at this point, this corridor is very, very important. Preserving this corridor is very, very important. It is a gem of our city. Uh, for me, and this is no disrespect to the council member who has Canal Side, but I know we've talked about Canal Side for years and bringing people into the city of Buffalo. This is more than about bringing people into the city of Buffalo. This is preserving our past. Uh, in ensuring uh, that when people come into this corridor, uh, that they are they come into a corridor that has been uh, preserved for its rich, rich history and to respect it. Um, so we will, Mr. Chair, leave this on the table two weeks. I fully plan so that uh, you do know in two weeks to move this issue one way or another uh, and to ensure uh, that whatever the city's obligation was and is, uh, to the property owners uh, that that will occur. So I appreciate everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have a motion to table by the majority leader, seconded by the council president. Next item. Actually, Mr. Chair. Council member Wingo. Can we revisit item number 21, please? Majority leader made a motion well on mute. He made a motion to revisit item 21 and that's seconded by council member Wingo. Okay. Uh, if, if it's possible that, that item, I, I, I was looking at the application itself and it says that they reached out and spoke to me that did not happen. So at this point, um, I would like to rescind or ask for that motion to be rescinded and, uh, to motion for that to, uh, be tabled. We'll, leave, we'll just close that hearing and uh, let that item stay in, on the table until I personally speak with the applicant so that I am completely aware of what uh, they're trying to build. I can read the documents for myself, but I would still like to hear um, their take on what it is they're trying to, to accomplish at that site on the corner uh, down there on Fillmore. All right, you got that majority leader? Motion is now to table. Uh, the motion, do we need a motion to rescind the previous motion to approve? Is that the case? Mm -hmm. Motion right. to rescind the previous motion. Seconded by Council Member Wingo. Motion is now to table. Seconded by Council Member Wingo. Thank you. Next item. Item 41, draft of Carriel's Law. 
Motion to receive and file items 41, 42, 43, 44. Can you scroll up? 49, keep on scrolling. 56, 57, 55, 56, 57. That's it. All right, seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Wyatt requested to revisit item number two, which is 20 1299. Motion to revisit item number two. Seconded by Council Member Golumbek. Item two, food store license 2577 Bailey. Items open. Council Member Wyatt, you have the floor. Okay, I just wanted to resend the previous motion to um, table and ask that it be sent without recommendation. Motion to resend the previous motion to table. Seconded by Council Member Glumbeck. Motion now is to send without recommendation. Seconded by Council Member Thank you. No further items. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, if we could revisit item number 16. You received and filed, but we didn't open and close the public hearing. Motion to revisit item number 16. Seconded by Council President Pridgen. Item 16, Special Instrument 832 Tonawanda. Is that the one where we have to close the public hearing? Yes. Motion to close the public hearing. Seconded by Council President Pridgen, unless someone's here to speak on that item. All right. What, would we, what do you want to do with the item? We will receive and file this. Motion to receive and file. Seconded by Council Member Glombeck. No further items, motion to adjourn. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon.